So what we're going to do is we're going to essentially run through the implant process, starting at the beginning, um, and discuss some of the sort of most interesting topics that come up as we go. Because the first slide is we're going to talk about newborn screening. So as you know, this has been uh, universal in the UK since 2005. So I was just going to start actually for interest, ask Natalie about the situation in France with newborn screening. Um, how long has it been universal and what's your sort of approach to it? So in France, uh, it has been uh, voted. It's in the law now since 2000 and, uh, 2012. And it has been progressively spread on the whole uh, as a nationwide. And now it's really effective since 2014. So we have like 10 years, we are 10 years behind you. <laughs> but now it's well organized. And so it's been a big progress for, for us as ENT and seeing children just after diagnosis very early on. Yeah, and do you, like us, do you have uh, different screening protocols for high risk and low risk babies? Yes, we, uh, we have the, the, the uh, maternity has have the, risk, the, the choice to choose uh, autoacoustic emission or um, uh, ABR, but when they, are, when they have high risk or when they are in uh, high risk maternity, they have to, it's mandatory to use the ABR. And do you think, or the other panel members think, that there's an argument for doing ABR in all babies? I think that there is, and in Australia they do ABR in all babies. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from, because I work on... I, I think that, I mean, it's more labour intensive, but it does uh, allow you to capture a, a few oddities, such as autoimmune neuropathy, uh, who might be missed if they're a well baby and don't go to the neonatal intensive care unit. The UK protocol is slightly different from France is that you get a basically get an autoacoustic emission uh, if you're a well baby and then you get an ABR if you spend more than 48 hours in the uh, in the special care baby unit for any reason. And the reason for that is that babies that have gone to the special care baby unit have a 10 times higher rate of sensory neural hearing loss, permanent childhood hearing loss than children who uh, who are from the well baby clinic. That's why there's the, the slightly different screening. But the, and, and for most babies, it probably doesn't really matter, but there is a situation where you can have normal, you can have a normal auto commission, but still a baby with a hearing loss. If the problem lies in the synapse from the inner hair cells to the cochlear nerve or within the cochlear nerve itself, and they can be missed if you just do auto acoustic emissions. But it's a pretty small number but it needs to be borne in mind that any screen has its holes, whether the patients don't attend or the screen isn't correct for every baby. Yeah. Uh, Ian, maybe I can move the side on and bring you in on the next, uh, on the next one. And that's um, the issue of CMV. I know it's something that we've worked on before. Do you think we'll ever get to a position where we're screening routinely for CMV? Or because we know it's a leading cause of, um, of the non-genetic non deafness in children, in particular unilateral deafness, but we don't currently screen mums or babies for it routinely. What's your view on that? Do you think that will change? I think all of these um, screening um, protocols have potential, or be they established or new, have potential drawbacks. So for CMV, um, yes, it would be helpful um, to know if a child's been exposed to CMV um, infection. However, well, it would from the perspective as well, because you can get a late onset hearing loss. So I suppose, do you want to have that information? Will that help parents? Bearing in mind, they may never develop a hearing loss and there'll be subsequent screening. I was thinking when, when I was listening to, to you talking before, I think one of the other things to put in the hat is um, we've all um, been aware of the 100,000 Genomes Project, uh, which has uh, recently finished uh, recruiting in the UK. And I, I wonder whether some aspects of or limitations of current screening uh, protocols may be um, addressed if we can think about genetic screening as well as an adjunct to um, current universal newborn hearing screening, sort of screening for uh, mutations associated with progressive hearing loss, things that uh, newborn hearing uh, screening doesn't pick up. So, yeah. or alternatively, identification of pendrids, you know, 
patients with a wide vestibular aqueduct now I appreciate that if they fail uh, newborn hearing screening then they're likely to get an MR but when does that MR occur so I, yeah. no system is perfect and in fact I was going to ask Natalie this again to get the um the French perspective in terms so, of in terms yeah. of genetic, genetic screen, do you routinely refer for genetic assessment or is that something you do on a sort of case by case? No, we, well, for each, each children, no matter which hearing loss they have, we all, for all of them, we look for CMV at a very early stage just to not miss it because afterwards when they're past one years of age, it's very hard to assess mm. to be sure it had been uh, congenital uh, yeah. CMV. Uh, so we look for CMV right, right start at the beginning. It, it, it can be for moderate or unilateral, bilateral, any kind of hearing loss. And we have the uh, genetic testing uh, uh, very early on, as, as early as we can. I mean, there's some delay in the, in the um, assessment because uh, we have to, we, we don't order ourselves. They have to go through the genetic clinic uh, but we are very, even if it's unilateral, even if it's a, a um, partial hearing loss, they all have the same screening uh, for genetic. That's interesting. I think another point, and, Steve, and when, is and, that, sorry. Sorry. When, when we uh, assess, uh, when the children are, uh, even if children are asymptomatic for uh, CMV, but they have a hearing loss, we discuss the treatment if the child is less than one uh, years of age. So there's impact for it's It's very important to get this information because there's some impact for the child. Yeah. And when you talk about treatment, are you, do you have access to the immunoglobulin treatment? No, it's a uh, uh, antiviral. antiviral. Yes. Antiviral. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on slightly. Unless, Ian, did you want to come back in there with... No, I was, thinking, I was just wanting to clarify as well that when we're talking about genetic screening, there are different things you can do. So the majority of the time in the UK, you're looking for connecting uh, gene abnormalities. But it may well be with next generation sequencing, um, exome uh, sequencing, that we uh, and new novel gene panels, that we can really widen the net, if you like, when we're thinking about genetics. Yeah. And and in fact, occasionally, a lot of the time, genetics doesn't actually change what you do, but occasionally it does. So I had a case recently of a, 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 a chap who was in his early 20s, but age 11, he developed um, a, uh, an, aut a, 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 an auditory neuropathy. It was all very peculiar. No one could really get to the bottom of it. And he'd, been, he'd gone from pillar to post in different countries and eventually in the UK about what was going on with him. And he came to see us and we sent off some bloods for genetics. And two years later, the, 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 the geneticist wrote to us and said, we've got it. And actually he's got an adult onset or a late onset auditory neuropathy. There's been two other cases in Korea and now the guy's gonna have a cochlear implant. Um, so in fact, sometimes the genetics does make a difference in ways that you can't expect. And I think they've just, they've, I'd agree with Natalie, they've all got to go off and they, you know, the, the old way of testing for connecting is, is going to be soon, I think, rather passe and basically they'll yes. all go off for whole, whole genome screening and then we wait and see what comes back. Yeah. yeah. Great. I'm going to move on slightly. If, if anyone is interested in learning more about etiological investigation for hearing loss, there are very detailed guidelines on the British Association of Audio Vestibular Physicians website. So if anyone wants to look more at the difference between unilateral and bilateral um, testing, there's a lot of detail on there. So we're going to move on now to talk about imaging. Um, just quickly, in terms of preference, I, we certainly an MRI scan is important to look for the auditory nerve. We know that. But would you do you normally leave it at that, or do you go for CT scan as well routinely, or only in selected cases? Perhaps start. I with would only yeah. I would only use it uh, a CT scan in selected cases. So. If there was a diagnosis of uh, craniosynostosis or marked uh, plagiocephaly flattening of the back of the skull that you can see in some children um, who've uh, spent quite a lot of time in, in a supine position, perhaps on the neonatal um, intensive care unit, for example. So I would order it in those situations, but I don't um, tend to or, or we wouldn't organise it otherwise. Yeah, I think that's right. And in terms of age, um... Natalie, do you try and do the MR early so you don't require a general anaesthetic? You can do it with the baby? Yes. Um, we, we, that's, now it's our reference. Uh, imaging is MRI. We just do the CT in very specific cases before surgery, for cochlear implant, or when we have a, a transmission um, 
if we, when it's neurosensory hearing loss, we, that's the first uh, imaging is MRI. And we, uh, we do those before the age of 12 months. And we have the best images go, looking also at the brain at the same time. Uh, when they're past six months of age. Before this, uh, sometimes you have a false uh, positive for um, a, a nerve, eight nerve anomaly. So we're very cautious not to do it too early. Uh, but when there's a cochlear implant in, in the uh, program, then we will organize the MRI before. But in any case, if we can, before the age of 12, uh, 12 months just to explore the inner ear and the nerve and the brain. And presumably you're doing these under general anesthetic then? No, it's no anesthetic. We, we have a specific uh, program with our, with our department. They don't do any uh, general anesthetic mm -hmm. unless it's very, very seldom. It's maybe 5% of children. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Um, can we can move, move on, on again. Yeah. That's okay. Um, unless anyone wants to add anything more on, on the sort of preoperative imaging. Um, that scan, by the way, shows enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Just while you're moving on, uh, so the only thing I would say is that if you're if the MRI is normal, then that's and uh, you're thinking of, for children who you're thinking I'm going to do a surgery, I'm going to do a cochlear implant. If the MRI is normal, then you're home and hosed. You don't need a CT scan for surgical planning. But if the MRI is abnormal, then often a CT scan is really, really useful. First of all, to look, it gives you more information about the inner ear. And particularly, I find it helpful in cases where there's hypoplastic or small cochlear nerves, because sometimes they can be really hard to see in a small IAM. But the CT scan, you can measure the size of the cochlear canal, which is quite a useful marker, a surrogate marker for whether there's a nerve there or not. Mm. You know, generally, if there's a good cochlear canal, then largely your you know, nerve will be okay. Yeah, and we may come back to that issue of hyperplastic nerves later if, if we get if we get time. So we'll move on for now, and we'll talk about the issue of um, glue ear, um, because as we know that can affect the um, the results from the auditory brainstem response. So, in terms of management, Ian, maybe I'll come to you first on this. What do you think about? management of this and would you put grommets in routinely what's your sort of protocol so, that, so i take it this is a child that's under um assessment for a yes correct account. sorry yes yeah. um we are or tend to be guided to a certain extent by uh, the confidence of the audiologists in the thresholds that they've uh, been able to uh, acquire and you've also got to decide what um improvement you're likely to have in the thresholds if you were to uh, drain the, you've, the you've gone a bit fusion so we'll often you know hello yeah you just your sound so, broke up a bit there could you just yeah start sorry again? yeah so it's it's a little bit about what the thresholds are and how near to uh being outside criteria that the child is and your confidence of your audiology really so if they're well in criteria and they've got glue ear and um, they're not making adequate process in terms of speech language, um, uh, social development, education, depending upon their age, then it really is unlikely that uh, draining the middle ear effusion will make a significant difference to their thresholds or, or enough difference to their thresholds that, that, that a conventional hearing aid is going to help them. So I, we have on occasions, and, and we still do, Particularly, for example, if, if one ear is in criteria and one ear is out, we will certainly um, be thinking about draining the glue and seeing, seeing what thresholds we have without it. But, uh, and if you do a little bit um, uh, disappointed, if you like, we, we end up draining the effusion. They're just outside criteria. And then six months later, they're in criteria with their grommets in. And you just think, OK. Yeah. And do you, if you do put grommets, do you, do you just leave them in place when you do the implant surgery or do you like to remove them, which I know is some people's preference? I now would leave them. However, the way we were trained was uh, in Manchester was to take them out and uh, graft the eardrum. James and Natalie, any, or James first maybe, any different view? Uh, no, very similar. Uh, the only time, the only thing I would say is if you see that picture and the, the CT or MRI scan shows an abnormal inner ear, there is the possibility that it's actually CSF and not glue, and that should go through your mind. If the inner ear is normal, that's very unlikely to be the case. It's, it's, but it's worth considering if there's an anomaly of the inner ear. Good point. And Natalie, any other thoughts? 
Yeah, it, I would have a slightly different point of view. Um, I've seen dramatic changes uh, in very early child, very before the age of 12, uh, changes, dramatic changes in ABR thresholds before and after the grommets. Um, and we, we perform grommets very early on just to assess the hearing test and make sure. And, and the second, and also it prepares for surgery because when you have surgery with glue ear or, or not dry ear or inflammatory, it's very hard. The surgery is much harder and you have much more complication, risk of complication. So anyway, you have nothing to lose to have the grommets very early on and then reassess no matter what, so you're very uh, confident and you prepare the surgery at the same time. Um, Great. Well, thanks. So we'll move on again now talk about the, the criteria, which last year in the UK or in England and Wales, NICE issued a uh, modification to the previous guidance. Um, and I'd just like to ask, initially perhaps from the UK perspective, Ian and James, the, what impact do you think this has had so far Clearly in adults, it's been a very, very big change. Has it been such a big change in children, do you think? Um, well, I can say from Manchester that our, our experience is not, uh, has been that it hasn't really made the, uh, the staggering uh, changes that um, perhaps some people are gonna um, uh, expect, but that represents variation in how the old criteria were applied. So roughly speaking, you might have half the, the centers in the UK that if they're assessing a child, they would, they would look at each ear individually. So I'm not suggesting that they're putting cochlear implants in for uh, single-sided deafness, but if you had one ear that was in criteria and the other one had a severe loss, then again, you, you will uh, implant that ch child often a little bit later because you need to be certain that they can't make adequate process with conventional hearing aids. So you have that group of, of uh, centers and then you have others that applied the old criteria uh, more strictly and said that your hearing had to um, be in criteria in both ears. So Manchester, we assessed each year individually and we also felt, and we also assessed the child. And so for our, for, in our perspective, no, it hasn't really changed things. You've still got what we have now is we have we've created a group of children that with one ear in and one ear out that we we can't implant because they're very very specific now that the hearing loss has to be in both ears. So for our, for our experience, no, hasn't changed it drastically, but obviously it's still early days. Natalie, perhaps I could ask you how your criteria compare to this. Do you have a similar levels and similar? Um, testing regime there? Or? Yes, it's about the same. Uh, we, they have to have bilateral, severe to profound. And so, uh, but we are not checked as much. So if you have a child that has moderate hearing lo loss and a severe to profound on the other side, and the, the child is not doing well or has uh, fluctuating or has a high risk of um, uh, getting worse, then we are a borderline, but we are yeah. authorized to have a small amount, like 10% of cases that are borderline. So we, and we can explain that to the authorities when, whenever we have double check. About That's really interesting candidates. because for me, I think the, the thing I would have liked to have changed is not so much the criteria, but the flexibility within them so that we can use that judgment. But as Ian said, I think I was a little bit more rigid. But this, this brings us this brings us on actually to the um, to the issue of neuroplasticity, and one of the most I think interesting areas in the field at the moment is this talk about the age at implantation. What's the optimal age to implant a child? So James, perhaps I could ask you, why don't we implant children who are three months old? What's what's the kind of perhaps you can explain to people the rationale? Well, from the neurodevelopmental point of view, the the obvious time to implant them would be at you know minus 12 weeks because that's when the normal auditory system starts to work some sort of intrauterine surgery would be the optimum if you really had to have it if you want to normalize these children's auditory experience you give them sound prenatally and obviously these children denied that they're then born and then there's a bit of hoo-ha and deciding that they're actually deaf which usually takes a few weeks at the start 
And if we take a child who's then unequivocally deaf, so they're not one of the ones that are on the borderline that Ian's talking about, but we're absolutely sure that they're deaf, then actually there is really no reason to delay from a neurophysiological point of view, because the sooner you implant, the better the long-term outcomes. But there is a balance, is that uh, the surgery, while not at all, you know, not hazardous, I mean, you know, a tonsillectomy is probably more hazardous than a cochlear implant, um, the you know it's a quite a it's a it's several hour surgery if you do one side a three or four operation if you do both sides at once uh, in a small child who's got a small head uh, they're probably only you know under three months they might only be five five and a half kilos at most uh, maybe smaller than that so you've you've you start to get into the realms where actual surgical risk becomes more of an issue and so then it's a bit of a trade off. Um, the other thing I think that needs bearing in mind is that the evidence is not strong that if you implant under about seven or eight months, that actually it makes much difference to the outcomes. Between three and six or seven months probably doesn't make much difference. That there is pretty clear evidence that if they're over a year, then you've missed the optimum window. So I think that that's a really good number if you're thinking about when the child should have their implants. Really, if they're unequivocally deaf on the newborn screen and they're a straightforward case, then and they're getting to above one, then you have to think, well, why are we waiting any longer? Because actually, as they go on further, then they may have a worse, they may have a worse outcome. That would be my view. I think that's probably how most people feel. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I think for an exam perspective as well for, for the UK um, uh, trainees, that we all, we're waiting for a little bit longer because ideally we'd like behavioral thresholds. So we would like to complement or our uh, electrophysiological testing with some behavioral testing. The other thing to say is that with the very young, the anesthetic risk is gonna be higher. So you're gonna have more reluctance from your anesthetist to have a, have a, a couple of month old child having um, a prolonged operation. But also there is, this, there is some evidence, particularly from North America, that if, it, as James said, if you implant under 12 months, well, you're gonna get a better result. What you've also got to bear in mind is that you have to have all these tests. It depends on the structure of your health system, at what age they're, at, they're actually referred into the cochlear implant program, because people may not be confident in their audiology um, early on. And then you've got to get a scan and you've got to have your MTT discussion, and this takes time. So whilst you must um, try to um, implant under a year in, in a congenitally profoundly uh, deaf child, there is the other important thing, which is coming to a stable map, i.e. Uh, getting to a point where you're confident that that cochlear implant is programmed appropriately for the child. And uh, the quicker that you can do that, uh, the better. So you can, you know, you may well implant a couple of months later than the center down the road but if you're quicker to a stable map then perhaps you've limited that difference yeah. well, it, just, one, just one quick point i think that what's really interesting though and i'm sure you know natty has seen this is the families where there's more than one deaf child so the first deaf child you go through this process and they come in at you know 10 or 11 months and you implant them they have the second deaf child and they're sat outside your office door and the child's six weeks old and they're saying why you know just do it today doctor so, in fact, uh, the, the parents who had experience, almost always, when, if they have a second child, they vote with their feet and they're absolutely chomping at the bit to get on with it. Yeah. And Natalie, I could ask you, perhaps, would you also be happy to operate younger if you needed to for a post-meningitic case where you started? Yeah, I, I, have, I fully agree with all what has been said. It's a balance. Of, of course, earlier is better, but below a certain age, a certain weight, it's, it's much harder, the mo much more risk for complication. And as it has been said, also it's a combination of the background, the family background, social background, are they ready for that? You have to push for earlier, but the, the timing has to be perfect for the concerning also the environment and being secure. So before the age of 12 months of age, for sure. Uh, before five months of age, mm, I wouldn't push too much, you know, just. Okay. Could, could I just um, butt in for a second? We had a question typed in from Andy uh, about the need for CT scanning. Um, and I don't know if you covered it or not. He said, would, would you use a CT scan for a kid with charge and other inner ear malformations? Did you cover that? Uh, we, we might move on to that, but I, I think the answer is yes. I think if there's, as James, I think, said, if there was any abnormalities on the MRI, that would 
that would most of the time be an indication for a CT scan. Okay, good. Okay. So can I add something? Yeah, Natalie. Yeah, just, yeah, if you're an experienced surgeon in, in, in otology and, and especially in cochlear implant, you might not, if on the regular cases, you might not need the CT. But if you're less experienced, I would still recommend uh, the uh, CT because you have some information about the facial nerve, the, the landmarks. And if you're not so, um, how do you say, experience uh, i would still rely on that too i don't know That's if you and I just add, with, with charge in particular 100 percent. i personally would get yeah. a ct scan because yeah. they can, it, those surgeries can be fiendishly yeah. difficult and in well, we might get on to you, this time in later in charge so. syndrome charge syndrome you not only have inner ear malformation but you have middle ear malformation and you have vascular malformation so you have to know what's how, how that the landmarks even after your incision you can have some surprise there. I find the key to charge cases to, to ask your colleagues to do them. <laughs> um, so I, there was some interesting... He's um, not looking at me, by the way. No, there's some interesting work recently about um, the neurocognitive effects of a prolonged GA. Do you think carefully about duration of anesthesia in a young child where there may be some cognitive impairment if you go over, I think they say, three, and, three to three and a half hours for a bilateral case? People talk, people talk about only having the most experienced surgeons so it's done quickly. <laughs> Is that something you're conscious of or not really on, too worried about? Uh, who, who are you asking the question uh, to? Well, Natalie, why didn't you answer first? Okay, uh, well, I would be concerned not for the neurocognitive, but in general, as a very young kid, you don't want to have a long surgery, uh, especially if you're doing uh, bilateral, when the child sits on the first implant and you have to do the second quickly because you don't want to have a trauma for the flap. And so anyway, the shorter is the better, but you still have to have the trainees or the younger senior um, operate on. So I would be concerned of shortening, but at one point, if it's a regular kid, I would still let some some other junior senior do it. I don't know. That's, so, okay. uh, Thank you. Let's let's move on then. I just wanted to bring in a topic that isn't talked about that much these days, but it's still there, and that's the attitudes of the deaf community towards cochlear implantation. <laughs> I, certainly, I see it less now than perhaps ten years ago. Mm. Would you agree with that? Do you think it's gone away? Is it still there in the background? What's Perhaps I'll start with Ian on this one this time. Yeah, I think this is a, um, a really interesting uh, topic and it's, uh, it's something that we're actually looking at at the moment in Manchester. So, certainly, if you look over the last 10 years, uh, we've gone from no um, uh, deaf signing parents uh, bringing their uh, profoundly deaf child to have a cochlear implant to the situation now where we're looking at our series and we've got over 30 um, where it, uh, children where at least one one of the parents uh, uses a visual language so it is an interesting one in part it reflects um, the opinions of the deaf community around uh, themselves and, and, and the actual hearing um, but also I think it's partly our failing because I don't think we've got the message out certainly um, not dissimilar to, to what you're hinting at with your cartoon we'll often have a scenario where the, the deaf uh, the deaf parents bring their child in and they think that the child's going to be in for five days they think they'll get a facial nerve palsy they think they'll have a 20 inch uh, scar on the side of the head so we're not getting the we're not getting the information out there but ultimately, there's two things I would like people to go away with. It's choice. And so if the parent's choice you know, is for their child to um, ha uh, communicate solely via uh, using a visual language, well, that's their choice and that is their right. Um, what I, as a cochlear implant surgeon, I just, for those parents who are interested in receiving information, I think we need to get that information right and it needs to be delivered in a way that they find uh, easy to access and it answers the questions that the deaf community want answered rather than the ones that we predict or we think they, that they should ask. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's really important. And then the last, the last thing I would leave you with is that it's not binary either. It doesn't mean that if you are um, 
we need to move away from from people thinking that if your household um, are BSL users, yeah, yeah. that if you have a child that has a cochlear implant, that that child can't use BSL. Uh, they can. So you, you there are, there are if we think about adults that we implant who are postlingually deafened, then some of those adults use their cochlear implant as um, a, a, as a benefit to, to lip reading or in difficult listening environments or or whatever. So it's not binary, you know, sign language or co or electrical hearing. It can be it you know you, it can be both, and it can be both in different situations. Mm. I think I think we'd all we'd all agree with that. So I, th I think we'll move on from that topic now. But James, perhaps I come to you on the next on the next topic, which is the issue of bilateral cochlear implantation. I think it's fair to say that the UK community was pretty shocked when this came in as a nice approved intervention in 2009. Is there any debate at all now about bilateral being better in nor in majority of cases? We'll, we may talk about special needs cases and other things later, but is there any doubt now that bilateral is better for for? I, I don't think there is. No, I think that. The parents prefer it. The child has one operation. They get on with the rest of their life. They don't have two anaesthetics. You always got, uh, you, you know, you're implanting the better hearing ear. They probably get some spatial benefits from having the implants, uh, you know, around the same, same time or with a very short delay. Uh, it probably improves outcomes. There's pretty robust uh, data on that. Um, and then finally, and, and this is pertinent to me recently, we had a child who was implanting bilateral implants and they come along at nine years later and with troubles with one of the implant but then we have to actually a bit of a faff to sort out but in fact the child's still hearing on the other side and if only for that reason that you've got two in there it's worth it so I don't think really there's any discussion there are marginal cases in whom you can you know there may be asymmetry in the hearing there may be other factors that make you stay your hand a bit but I think that I think from the UK perspective and I from my personal beliefs and from I think that there's very little reason not to go ahead with two in it, you know, unless there's a very, very strong reason otherwise. And Nat Natalie can, can ask your view on this. Is that the same in France? Do you do a routine yes, bilateral in, in children? Yeah, well, it, again, uh, as we started the uh, screening on a later stage, there has been also a lot of discussion because of this one clinic that was very uh, famous about testing vestibular disease in children and was very concerned and loud about the vestibular dysfunction created by, by uh, cochlear implant and especially in bilateral simultaneous. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm completely uh, fully agree with what with uh, James and we are pro pro um, proposing to when we have uh, early screening bilateral simultaneous very early on uh, there are some families that are a little bit reluctant, but most of them are really into bilateral. Um, but some, you know, some other hospital are just doing one side and then second side after the second, we have double checked the vestibular function. We can check the vestibular function very early on on children as, as soon as they're five or six months of age. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a good point of view to check the inner ear in general, cochlear and vestibular function in any hearing loss. So it's good to have this in view and, and keep, keep in mind that we have to protect the function of vestibular function even after during the surgery. So that's good, uh, but it doesn't have to hold back for the bilateral simultaneous. Yeah, and yeah I, I, I agree with that. And I think in particular what we what we found is that since we've been introducing soft surgery, so surgery that is designed to preserve inner ear structures, primarily that, that this was introduced to preserve fine structures within the cochlea, I personally, we're not seeing um, nearly as much post-operative imbalance in the uh, older children and adolescents who can really tell us what's going on. So I think soft surgery, irrespective of whether you've got um, residual natural hearing that you can measure, doesn't matter. We still do a soft surgical approach because we're pre preserving fine structures within the inner ear. Yeah. And James, perhaps I, that moves us on actually nicely to our next mm. topic, which is the surgery. Ian's talked about soft surgery, which I think is pretty much universally accepted now. Perhaps you could tell us for you what the key points are that make surgery soft compared to a standard 
or something perhaps we would have done a few years ago. So uh, uh, the opposite of a rough surgery. So I don't think many people really do, they don't do rough cockroach <laughs> surgery. You know, I, I've certainly seen it happen and I've done it myself on occasion. You know, uh, you know, it's not always quite as soft as you would like. You, know, you want to be like Neil Armstrong touching down on the moon. You know, there's hardly a dust cloud raised. Whether they landed on the moon or in Texas, it doesn't matter. It was a soft landing. And I think that's probably true. That The principles of the surgery are you want as small a hole as possible. You don't want to be raising big skin flaps or devitalizing tissue around the so soft tissue because, in fact, actually soft tissue complications are a nightmare to sort out. We may come on to those. And they can be largely completely avoided by careful handling of the soft tissue before you even get to the periosteum. And then when you're, when you're the other part that you have to be soft at is when you get to the to the round window and uh, you know, there are various everyone has their own slight w way of doing things but the but the principle is that you don't want to be drilling inside the cochlea because you may traumatize the basal membrane you may traumatize the inner ear you may cause blood to accumulate there and that you may get post-operative scarring and then finally when you insert the device you want to choose a device that's going to slide in nice and smoothly and ideally will be positioned in enti entirely within the um within the, the correct component of the of the inner ear and not translocate across the basilar membrane because first of all you're going to destroy any residual hearing although that may not be important but also you're going to perhaps have a less healthy ear in the long run if, it, long run if you start mixing endolymph and perilymph by traumatizing the basilar membrane the, the evidence is not really there, I don't think, that in the long run it makes a great difference to the hearing outcomes, but it's probably, as it's just as easy to do soft surgery, it probably is a better thing to do, and you should aim to do it in every case. Even if it's not necessary, it's good practice for the hearing preservation cases where you actually have a pretty good marker for whether your hands have been soft or not, because you do the hearing test afterwards. I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, and, and, and one of the one of the scenarios is if, if, if you're born in the UK or Europe, now then without any other comorbidities your life expectancy is going to be in excess of 80 years so whilst we don't know necessarily how long a cochlear implant is going to last you you certainly will predict that the, that uh, child or, or young adult or adult would would need uh, another implant during their lifetime and so if the principle of soft surgery is to limit intracochlear clear scarring and inflammation then surely that will make it easier to put a new one in when the time uh, it, when, when it's needed the other important thing to say is we do use steroid um, in animal models it's been shown to be cochlear protective but we don't know what the dose is when to give it and how to give it interesting question from a mr quo from birmingham being typed in um asking that if covid's going to be going on and on and on uh, would we not be better taking the risk of the odd child catching COVID uh, rather than just getting a great big pile of children waiting for implants? Well, we're in line with a lot of other um, centres. We're about to restart um, within <coughs> the next two, two to three weeks. We'll be restarting cochlear implant surgery, uh, particularly <laughs> targeting those children that don't have um, residual hearing. So they don't have access to sound. It's you know, they're not, a hearing aid's not going to be any uh, use to them. So those children are now uh, moving towards elective surgery. Natalie, you've been doing them in Paris for a while, haven't you? Yes. You started yes, quite we, quickly. We, yeah, we wanted, for us, it's a semi-urgent. I mean, uh, just after when it settled a little bit, we pushed to start with the children that had no hearing or late diagnosis, just the one that were needed really as we thought we sorted the cases for the children that had a need for a second second side uh sequential or had residual hearing they can wait a little bit but the other ones are just going so we started again okay okay so perhaps we can move on now to talk about electrode choice i guess the biggest debate in this area is whether you're a believer in the position of the electrode within the cochlea making a big difference. So some people favor something that hugs the modiolus, other people prefer the lateral wall, so-called lateral wall electrode. What, James, perhaps I come to you first, what's your sort of go-to electrode in terms of position within the cochlea and length and that sort of thing? Um, well, I think, um, I mean, I, I can tell you what I use, but in fact, I think that the, the it, it's a little bit about how many angels dance on the head of a pin. I mean, there are things, some children who have cochlear anomalies, uh, 
or they may have residual hearing that you may definitely choose a certain electrode because you have a belief that it's going to do one thing over another. But for the great majority of children, actually, they have, the difference is greater between the children than it is between the electrodes. I think you must use something that you're comfortable using. You must use something that you can put in softly to preserve hearing, preserve cochlear structure. And you must have something that you feel confident that, as Ian says, that in 10 or 15 years time, you or your descendant, one of the registrars listening today, perhaps, is going to be able to take out and change. Mm. And, 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 and they're the things that I try and, and bear in mind. I think that it, it, the other thing is that different, different hospitals, and different countries have quite different patterns of use of electrodes and it probably comes down at the end of the day as much to financial as much as anything if you go to austria everyone's going to get one type of electrode if you go to australia everyone will get another type of electrode but it's not that the austrian children are different than the australian children it's just the way that it happens to be so um i, I don't i'm not really i'm not you know uh, um really strict on that i think you need to think though because the main difference is between whether you want a hearing preservation electrode that gives you the maximum chance of not damaging the inner ear or, or whether that's not so much of an issue but uh, i think i don't know what, what the others think yeah no i i would abs i would tend to um well i would entirely agree with you i think there's a lot of um, as you would imagine within the pharma industry there's a lot of money spent with these companies trying to say that they're better than somebody else and nobody is universally better it's it's like a the analogy would be like playing a round of golf you pick the club for the shot and i think you've got to um <laughs> all of these companies have a range of of implant electrodes and so you have some options broadly speaking from for an exam perspective you either have perimodiola so has some sort of spring mechanism so it, um the electrode Electrode, when it's activated, if you like, will tightly hug the modiolus. So the, the thought there being, if you think about each electrode on that array being like um, a child hold, holding a torch, the further away you are from the torch, the wider the beam. So it's what we call spread. If you're on the lateral wall, so you're not uh, next to it, then obviously the spread of that beam is further. However, you are less likely to damage residual hearing if you have a lateral wall electrode. The other thing would be think, thinking about the length of the electrode. And again, some companies say you need cochl complete cochlear coverage. Uh, another company would say, well, that's not needed because the spiral ganglion cells end uh, before the apex of uh, the cochlea. So... I think perhaps the thing to think about is, is when we started trying to preserve natural hearing, if we think about the tonotopic representation of the, of the cochlear implant, um, the cochlear, uh, sorry, of the cochlear, like a cochlear duct, like a piano keyboard, that we use short arrays because we thought, well, the best way to preserve that residual low frequency hearing, which is sensed within the, within the apex of the cochlear, is to go nowhere near it. Um, but um, the problem was then is, do you have the concept of preserving hearing and then you've got to preserve, uh, maintain that preserved hearing. So the problem is you might put a very short electrode in, which is brilliant, and you've preserved all the natural hearing. But a, a year later, when the natural hearing is gone, that patient may not have as good an outcome because you've not covered enough of that piano keyboard. Natalie, can I ask you, we've talked uh, already, Ian and James have both mentioned revision surgery. Yeah. Um, does that does the thought that an average baby now is going to need two at least probably possibly three implants over the course of their lifetime does that influence your electro choice the first yeah, time yes for sure that uh, that's the only thing i wanted to add to but i agree with what had been said i think some children has very specific needs like very specific inner ear malformation out of that we really have to think on the long term and the first thing is not to hurt the inner ear and to think that one day this person will need to have removal of this. And the first surgery is the main one. If you, if you traumatize the inner ear, then, then the second one, the extraction will be very hard and then you get into trouble. If the first insertion is atraumatic and made in the proper way, then you are very less likely to have any uh, concern for afterwards. So, and you have to think of the long term, 80, 80 years from now, maybe there will be in treatments or other things. So you have to preserve the structure. Yeah. Um, and, and the second thing is 
overall, the brain makes much of the difference. I mean, the brain is like 80% of the hearing. We think only uh, peripheral hearing, but hearing is not only the, the cochlear, it's the nerve and it's the brain. And the brain makes a lot of difference. Some, some adults have been implanted a very long time ago, have only eight electrodes, uh, eight electrodes working, still working, and they still can hear. So it, it makes a difference to a certain point. But we have to keep in mind to keep the um, inner, the structure, um, like eight, um, uh, uh, I did preserve the inner ear, yeah, structure. I think perhaps in Toronto always used to say that, um, I'm sure he still does say that basically we're ear surgeons, so we think about it as being a cochlear implant. But actually, it's a, it's a brain stimulator. That's, yeah. that's all it is, it's a brain stimulator. Exactly. It just has to go in the ear because that's where it has to go. Mm. It's like Jerry O'Donoghue who calls hearing aids brain aids mm. to try and help the adults reduce their risk of dementia. So I'm going to move on now to um, perhaps skip this one, move on to talk about hearing preservation, which we have touched on in terms of surgical technique. But I'm interested to know, Ian, I know you've done a lot of work. Well, in fact, you all have done a lot of work on this. But Ian, I'll come to you first. What do you tell this patient, probably a slightly older child who's considering a cochlear implant, um, we'll assume they're not doing very well with the hearing aids or perhaps you wouldn't be having that discussion, but what do you tell them about the likelihood of preserving that hearing? Um, as in all operations, you're better off to give uh, giving your own um, percentages, if you like, and how we actually measure preservation of course that's a, a variable and, and, and that limits the ability to sort of combine and contrast data but again I'd be really interested in this audiogram um, um, uh, to know what the hearing was at 250 uh, and 125 because the way it's going that's going to certainly be normal isn't it so your options are uh, in a way if so they're not they're not um they're not making adequate pro uh, progress or life's too, too difficult from an, in the educational uh, setting with their conventional hearing aids. So you say, okay, you, do you go for one? Do you go for two? And if you go for two, do you do the surgery in uh, one, st one, one stage, i.e. do a bilateral or do you do a sequential bilateral? And it's a really um, interesting and difficult uh, conversation to have. Our results with the particular electrode that we are most confident with are getting increasingly consistent. So we'll say to people, well, the possibilities you could lose your hearing in both ears for a few um, weeks, um, or you might lose it in one and, and not the other. And, and so again, it's a risk and benefit, and, and it's best if the if the if the young child or young person is involved in the decision making process. But to be honest with you, whilst I know uh, plenty of people that would say I, I wouldn't offer bilateral uh, simultaneous, um, I've got to say that I'm so confident in the electrode now. I would of course tell them of the risk, but I think more than 80% of the, of the time we can preserve, in this sort of audiogram, we could preserve some hearing that is useful. But again, coming back to what we talked about, problem at the moment is we can preserve the hearing, but we don't know how to maintain it. And that may, com may come in the next generation of cochlear implants, which have which are drug eluting, so either they're uh, releasing some sort of uh, neurotrophic factor, steroid, or, or whatever. So it looks like from the literature that we can, we, if we preserve the hearing, it's at least maintained for a couple of years, but often it just drops off a cliff uh, when you do that. So some pa patients will say with that, okay, well, I'd rather just have the operation except there's about an 80% chance I'll have something in those few weeks until I'm hearing electrically and then go from there and then one last point it's interesting you are preserving structure so that is important what does preserved low frequency hearing do it seems to help with um, some aspects of intonation it seems to um, help with uh, music appreciation or listening in background noise but it's, you know, and the other, it's not an absolute game changer, but it is important to try to preserve it. And the last thing is our adolescents that have really good, let's just say with this, uh, these audiograms, we've got a cochlear implant in there and they've still got that audiogram because some of them do. It's interesting that the majority of our young people still want the cochlear implant programmed, thinking about that sort of piano keyboard, if you like. They don't want half the piano keyboard switched off. They want it programmed without 
um, consideration or reference to their natural hearing. And we don't really understand that at the moment. Natalie, I'll come to you. And then James, I'll come to you after. What would you like to add, Natalie, to that? So um, the thing is that we look, usually we look at the audiogram, the tonal, tone audiometry only and what is very helpful also for decision making for families and for the teens because they you look at their audiogram and they say there's a lot of hearing we don't want to lose that but what is the uh, everyday life uh, use of this hearing so we have to look also at the uh, speech intelligibility rate and especially uh, how they can hear in noise because usually it just fell off. I mean, you have maybe 80% of hearing in, in a booth, in, in a silent environment, but, but that's not real life. And when you do the testing in, in noise, it just drops so much, they understand how much they can gain. So it's not just looking at the tone of geometry, it takes a, a, a huge step forward because that is where they will have the first help. Second thing is that sometimes it's hard to have bilateral uh, simultaneous because in the meantime they have the sw switch on they have no hearing or they have very little hearing so that's why you can manage saying okay well might be doing both and keep the hearing aids until we have stabilized on the other side but that's that's just options you discuss with the young people or with the patient the parents and James, James, what do you? Would you I think that was a brilliantly chosen audiogram, actually, because um, that audiogram we could just you could have a whole hour seminar mm. on just that audiogram. In yes. fact, it's absolutely right on the money, which is probably why you chose it. And I think for the registrars listening, who, who are for both adults and children, the reason you should take a photograph and think about that audiogram is it illustrates several really important points about hearing. The first is that low frequency hearing, that is below one kilohertz, is not useful for speech understanding. It is almost irrelevant for speech understanding. All of your speech understanding is one kilohertz and above. So that's the first thing. So if you see an audiogram like that, they're probably suitable for a copper implant. Secondly, the other point is that the, the one kilohertz is at 60 decibels. And that is, a, in my experience, is a key point. If the one kilohertz is above 60 decibels, they're usually managing with hearing aids and they don't want a cochlear implant. And if the, 60, if the one kilohertz is at 60 decibels or below, they have lost that last little tiny bit of understanding of the high frequencies and then they're better off with an implant. The second thing I would say about that, and I agree entirely with what the others said, I would do a bilateral implant for a child like that if they wanted to go ahead and were otherwise suitable. But the, the other thing that I would say is that although an implant, you know, otologists can be a bit, um, you know, shall we say, pernickety. Surely not. Yeah, it can happen, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll go to meetings and people will present the most astonishing data about how the low frequency, you know, the, these sort of, the, the, the benefits of maintaining the low frequency. We all sort of beat our chest because we don't have cancer to deal with. So preserving those decibels in the low frequencies, that's Ian and I's arm wrestle at meetings and we should like to show how we've done it. But the bottom line is the patients are largely like Bob Dylan. So Bob Dylan in 1966 went from acoustic to electric and he played a tour in Manchester actually, famously, where he played the first half of the concert acoustic and everyone's clapping along to Mr. Bojangles. And then at the interval, he comes back and he'd gone electric with a different band. And the crowd are booing him and starting Judas and all the rest of it. But the bottom line is, if you listen to that concert now, the second half, the electric half, is outstandingly better than the first half. And the children vote with their feet. If you implant a child like this, they never say, oh, I love, even if you preserve their hearing perfectly. No. They, yeah, exactly. They having the low frequency because they say, when I don't have my implants on and mum calls me for tea, I hear there's something going on and I come from a tea. But they like their electric, they go electric, and they, they are 100% committed to electric, and they often don't even use a hearing aid processor if you fit them to them. So, so, so that, you know, they, because they love those high frequencies. It's like hearing crack cocaine, the high frequencies. Great, thank you. I'm going to do this all. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Because <laughs> Matt, can't, you can't be popular crack cocaine no. next time. Okay. James, I'm going to stick with you, actually, because I know you've got one of the largest experiences in the UK of Karina. So I picked this audiogram as an example, and obviously it's difficult without specifics, but this is a sort of case where you've perhaps got options. And how often do you see the situation where you're sort of, perhaps without going into specifics of any case, but generally, how often do you have a situation where you think, 
this could be a middle ear, it could be a bone anchor, or it could be a cochlear, and you're sort of having to choose between them. Or do you find you're always pretty clear that when it's in, in the threshold, you're going for a cochlear implant? Looking at that audiogram, I would always think, could I use a middle ear implant? And I almost always decide that that's totally unsuitable. And I'm a bit suspicious of an audiogram like that um, because, and I think again, for the registrars, you look at the, the air conduction threshold, you can be pretty clear cut about. But, you know, the, 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 the bone conduction that the audiologist is marked, that might just be the, they're getting vibrotactile. It's a rather suspicious bone conduction. You know, it, it, could be, it could be actually completely sensory neural. So I would have to be really persuaded that there was, that there was, that there was a, a reason why they would have better cochlear reserve you know, on one, if it's not easy to mask on one side, it's quite hard to tell which side that might be, in fact, although it's marked on the right. Um, you can't but really mask that. It's unmasked. Here it's unmasked. Mm. Yeah. So I think, Steve, I think James will be able to confirm it and, and, and Natalie, but I think I understand it. That the the Korean has been withdrawn from the market. It has been withdrawn. It's not suitable for under 14 year olds anyway. And I, I would be looking at a cochrane implant on a child like this. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Explain to me very gently what a Carina is, because I'm not really. I wouldn't get too excited. Cause it's just been withdrawn from sale, but basically, it's a very, it's a powerful sort of uh, vibrator that you can attach to any part of the circular chain. And what's not neat about it is that it, a, it's very powerful, and b, it's completely under the skin. But it's a bulky bit of kit, and it's uh, it's only suitable for adults. And I just think it's been withdrawn, not because it was a duff bit of kit, but because I think it's not profitable because the the number of people who need it are not very great in fact and so it's just yeah i think i think there was four to six hundred people i think around the world um that that, that received them but the, the, the shame is is that i hope it doesn't limit the evolution of of implantable microphones and that's that you know that's because that, that's what you had you had a you had a, a a fully implantable hearing aid um that like like the evolution of cochlear implants it may well have been the forerunner of something else so let's hope it's not the end of that story i agree so we're going to move on to talk about a couple of topics now that are quite common exam questions and this is sort of management of infections in cochlear implant cases so we'll start with the commonest which is the child with recurrent acute otitis media and we'll assume you've tried some sort of conservative measures um well perhaps i could ask you perhaps um Natalie, I'll come to you first for this one. Would you would you use grommets in a child with a cochlear implant who's getting recurrent acute otitis media, sort of uncomplicated recurrent acute otitis media, or would you try and steer clear of them? For sure. I, uh, as soon as I have a, a plan of surgery, I need an, a clear ear. Uh, and if the child had had recurrent, I keep the grommet even though I had done the surgery and if the child hasn't got grommet I do it afterwards if needed we don't want any acute or or, or chronic ear after the surgery it, there's always the risk for for meningitis there's always a risk for complication uh, infection on the implant electrode array we don't want any infection there and Ian perhaps I could ask you would you would you try your prophylactic antibiotics in this child or would you tend to have a lower threshold no. for putting grommets in? No, uh, and, and if you asked me 10 years ago, the way we were taught is that you try to avoid um, uh, a grommet because you felt that that was going to you know, be a, a conduit or a route in uh, uh, to the middle ear for infection, but absolutely not. The Europeans have been far ahead uh, of us in this, in this regard. Guard. And so now I have a very low threshold for inserting a grommet if a child's having recurrent acute otitis media after surgery. And like, likewise, if I put a grommet in before the surgery, uh, be it for glue ear and threshold assessment or because of recurrent acute otitis media, then I would leave it at the surgery. The, the days when I would be patching it and all this sort of mm. stuff at the, at the time of the surgery, I don't do that anymore. And James, perhaps for the next case, um, we'll come to you first. This is the child obviously with an acute mastoiditis will it, it will assume it's a child who's got a cochlear implant in. Do you have a lower threshold than normal for draining this surgically or are you worried about damaging the implant by doing so? I am worried about damaging the implant. I mean, you certainly, um, I, the, first of all, it, it, mastoiditis is, I think, a bit less common in children with cochlear implants because they've had the mastoid all opened up and it's all ventilated. But when they do get an ear infection, it goes red at the drop of a hat. Because there's often they haven't regrown completely the cortical bone. Yeah, exactly. 
any bit of otitis media, they go red right away. So it's, we see quite a lot of these kids. I think I, I personally wouldn't leap, if a child is well, and it's you know not obviously a great big fluctuant mass, then I would certainly try some intravenous antibiotics like keftraxone uh, and an overnight admission uh, and see how they go. Uh, if, it's, if it's purulent and fluctuant, I think there's pus in there, then I usually would just make a tiny little stab incision and I, um, we're fortunate in Oxford in that all the surgeons who put the implants in do it in basically exactly the same way. And you, I can, you can be pretty sure where the wires are going. So we make an incision where we think the wires aren't, just make a little stab, open it up with some, uh, some forceps. I wouldn't drill out the whole mastoid because then you are going to get into a world of pain where you start to damage the implant. Mm -hmm. Just the, maybe a little drain and it will almost always settle down without anything else needing doing. It's more tricky if the... Um, case comes from another center and you're not quite sure where the wires might be running in which case you just have to be very very careful i would i would i would use a needle to puncture and take the pus, some of the pus out if if it resists to antibiotics and maybe put a grommet usually it just settles. Oh, yeah. it's very impressive but after cochlear implants it's not a big deal yeah no. what, yeah, about this next, what about this next case where we've we're starting to see some extrusion uh, not, of not good perhaps the uh, <laughs> not good <laughs> perhaps the acute infection has settled down you've tried your iv antibiotics perhaps it's even settled temporarily on some iv antibiotics mm. so the question is is this salvageable ian what what's your experience of this oh it makes me sort of wake up in a cold sweat um mm. i can, can say that our ex they're, thankfully they're very rare uh, these sort of, but but it's been my experience that um, once you start seeing the implant, I can't save it, and I can tell you that um, we've tried advancement flaps, we've tried uh, prolonged antibiotic intravenous antibiotics, we've um, tried just uh, and, and taking an ellipse of the unhealthy skin smothering everything in betadine and all of these sort of things and i think we've tried it um as i say because it's thankfully rare uh met three times three or four times and we have a success rate of zero percent in saving that uh, implant it is interesting because i have spoke to colleagues that i am certain you know i, I believe their experience um from uh israel and um, yeah. uh, Ian, you dropped um, out a bit. Able to save these implants, so I, I don't know whether the bugs are different. Does anyone else have? I mean, my experience is once you've got a biofilm on there, it's it's a it's a goner. Natalie, do you? Yeah, we we, we don't we don't like those. Um, the same uh, in our experience, it's two third of the implant goes has to be removed. You only save one third of them, and depends how long it has been going. You still need to have the antibiotics tried on, but usually the flaps, etc., doesn't really uh, help. Uh, it yeah. depends also if it's uh, spontaneous, spontaneous, or if there's a, any trauma that has been starting there, and maybe the the place, the placement of the casing is very important so also right at the beginning when you put the implant you have to think you don't want anything sticking out under the skin especially in very young kids because it's very thin the skin is very thin and if if the implant is a bit sticking out then at on the long term you can have some local trauma mechanical trauma and then lead to this so it's also the initial techniques will will impact on the long term do you think we've seen more of this since we've stopped drilling wells? It's not my my understanding. Well, we, no, I, I, it's still rare, isn't it? Thankfully, yeah, they still they they keep, but now the casing, the 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 in, internal part is thinner than it used to be too. Yeah. So I think it helps too. Why did you stop drilling wells? I do I do drill I do well, drill I, wells too, uh, I do drill a bit the the bone to make it sure it's just mm. under the skin. Yeah, I, I, the thing is I don't. I sorry. Use a technique. We can I don't it. drill. I don't drill a well. I uh, 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 create a tight periosteal pocket, but I definitely uh, drill a channel yeah. uh, for the electrode cable on the lateral aspect of the skull because that's when you. Uh, when you remove a failed implant after trauma, that seems to be where, where the uh, problems are. Isn't. 
Yeah. When I when I do my my PhD, when I uh, you know retire and I have time on my hands, <laughs> I think one thing that's really interesting is that this this sort of case you can read the serial number on that implant. If you read the serial number on the implant, it's a goner. You know, it's a it's had it in my experience. <laughs> yeah. So so that's I think it's probably not gonna not gonna survive. The what's interesting is if you get infection around the receiver package up there, it, it's you know that's it. We're done. But you can get the most appalling things happen to the electrode in the mastoid in the middle ear, cholesteatoma, infections, granulations, glue ear, mastoiditis, rada, 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 rada. And you clean it up and tidy it up. And as long as the receiver package isn't damaged, you've got a pretty good chance of saving that implant in the long run. There's something immunologically different about where the package bed sits in the soft tissue and under the periosteum in the scalp and the mastoid middle ear component where the electrode sits, because the the, the, the the properties of infections in those two seem to me very, very different. And it, it's much more salvageable if it's a middle ear mastoid problem. I agree. I'm gonna move us on because we're coming towards the end of our time now. So perhaps uh, as a final but quite important topic, when we talk about children with additional needs, we know that probably 30% at least of children having cochlear implants have some kind of additional need. So Ian, perhaps I'll come to you first and just ask in general terms, if you see a child with you know, complex needs, what kind of issues, just in general terms, are you sort of considering in, in offering this child cochlear implantation? Well, for, well, firstly, I think that the, your last part of your sentence or question was the most important thing. We would still consider um, a cochlear implantation in a child that had a, a physical Im, um, impairment or a cognitive um, impairment. But again, one of the first things you've got to think about is you've got to make sure that um, their access to sound is already uh, maximised. And you've also got to think about, well, when, what would a cochlear implant do? And just because at the moment we don't have the, the right tools to measure benefit in children with, with um, cognitive impairment, it doesn't mean that their benefit will be any less or any less important. And you may well need to look at what a benefit will look like. It may be that a child with, um, I, I don't know what the particular pathology is, but let's just say that child has um, cerebral palsy. It wouldn't be realistic necessarily to think that um, the child will develop intelligible speech. But if that child is able to interact with its mother and family uh, in a much easier um, and um, enjoyable way, then that is still a triumph and an important thing uh, for that child. In terms of the surgery, what, do you do one or two? How can you, you know, this concept, of, well, should you do one, make, see how the child does? Um, it, is, um, it is difficult, I think, for, for children with a cognitive impairment to sometimes adapt to that second implant, but um, I don't think that uh, would preclude thinking about it. And then the last thing is that child's in a chair. So you've also got to think about retention of the cochlear implant. So if you're going to put the cochlear implant in, you're going to put it in fairly vertically because or, um, you want to, to keep the uh, coil away from the um, headrest. So it's going to be really important to um, talk to the parents about their experience of wearing hearing aids, for example, prior to coming to see you. Natalie, anything to add for the child? Yeah, well, also same completely, but I would say also um, they, those children, some of them will, most of them, I would say, might not get into, they will hear, but not get into language because language is another, another issue. Um, and on the long term, I see, I've seen those children uh, on the long term follow up when they become teens and uh, they are in very uh, specific environment as to uh, uh, schol scholarship and um, and some on the long term become non users uh, they, they have overall a higher, higher risk of becoming non users um, because they, their environment with uh, sign language or because it's they have other disabilities that like autism or neurological uh, impairment. But still, it's worth trying because you never know how it will turn. But the counseling of parents are very specific in those children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, exactly. Can I just say one thing, Stephen? Sorry. Um, the, the, the literature would say that um, the, co the child's cognition will affect outcome. 
But actually, although the, there aren't hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of cases in the literature, the evidence that is there shows that really motor function, uh, that motor component of any sort of cerebral palsy, for example, that has little or no uh, impact on, on actual success, if you like, what the child can do with their cochlear implant. It's all about cognition. It's all about your central processor. Yeah. And James, are you, would you be more likely to offer a single implant to this a child who's perhaps in a chair and, and difficult uh, reduced mobility or are you still generally going for bilateral in most cases? I think these are really difficult discussions. I was listening to what the others say. I mean, I, th I think these children are really hard to know what the right thing to do is. Uh, in fact, the, the part of the issue is that these children often pitch up at the age of one to 15 months. It's actually all, it's very hard to make a really accurate prediction about what their cognition is going to be like when they're significantly older. So uh, having had that, if, if, if it's a young child and you have that discussion, and in fact, the, you know, the, 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 the direction of travel then is you say, well, we don't know what it's going to be, it's even the best shout. So in fact, quite a number of our children do end up with bilateral implants because we say, well, if they're deaf and we think they're going to benefit, and we do that for a hearing child and we think they benefit more from two, what's different about this child? I think there is, there is definitely um, there, I mean, it's shades and shades of grey, and I honestly don't know the answer. It's I'm going to move. Each, move each on case are different, yeah. Yeah, I agree with. It's very difficult, as you say. Let's move on to the to the last slide now. Okay. So I think we just next slide. Sorry. Oh, pardon me. We, we've touched on some of the anomalies and things previously. So I'm going to move us on to the end now and ask you each to predict the future as a sort of parting <laughs> shot for this session. Um, we've talked a bit about COVID, and we're assuming that we're going to go back to um, to doing routine implants, but. If I had to ask you, the, what, what do you think is the one thing that's going to change the field of cochlear implants in the future? I'm not talking about small changes to electro design or surgical technique. What's going to be a game changer in the next, say, five to ten years? Perhaps I'll start, start with Ian. Um, the cochlear implant as a drug delivery unit, so delivering uh, drugs, um, cells or genes to the cochlear. And Natalie? Um, I would add uh, improving our knowledge on the brain because we know it's a connect a nectum. It we some some children are disconnected in central central nervous system and doesn't do well with the implant and we don't understand why. Yeah. And so better understanding this will be a big step forward. And James, I agree with both of the others, which were on my list. And the, the other thing is is you know. You, you, completely implantable implants by, by hook or by crook making it so they're completely underneath the skin so that you can hardly even tell that these children are deaf except that they're able to listen to their telephone from the next room which a normal child can't do. Excellent thank you all I very can. much. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very, very okay. insightful. That's, that's yeah. terrific. Um, so before we go I'd like to uh, just bring up a few more slides. BAPO uh, has been, uh, is going to happen in the 18th of September in Birmingham and we are confidently expecting it to go ahead, uh, although obviously things going on with COVID, but we're thinking that by that time we'll be able to have meetings. And the hall that Mike has found in Birmingham to hold it in is so big that even if 100 of us turn up or 200, we can still be two meters apart from one another. So <laughs> have no fear. And he's assembled an absolutely fantastic international uh, panel. Um, ESPO has been uh, rearranged from this year. I mean, we should realistically be out there now enjoying the sun and the wine in Marseille, but we're not. So it's going to be happening in February next year. Um, and I have got a slide for Liverpool, but uh, stop press, I believe Liverpool has been postponed to, to a year later as well. Am I right in saying that, James? Did yes, you, you are. 2023. So more to follow. Okay. So I would like to finish by thanking the international panel, particularly Natalie, for coming all the way from Paris, <laughs> which I'm sure is fantastic this evening. Uh, and James, who's come all the way from Oxford, and Ian, who seems to have dropped off the radar, uh, <laughs> coming from Manchester. This.